Hi students, welcome to the third and final segment of the Patterns of Inheritance lecture. Um, as I was saying, the ABO blood groups in humans are examples of multiple alleles. Um, and if you've ever had your blood type determined, you basically add the antibodies for um, these various types of carbohydrates, A and B, to um, a sample of your blood. Um, for example, if you have the O blood type and you add um, the antibody serum that has A antibodies, you're going to get um, a reaction. You're going to get clotting because your own blood does not contain um, the carbohydrate type A. Similarly, if you were to add the antibody serum with the type B to your own blood, you're going to get a reaction, and if you add AB, you're also going to get a reaction. So if you have type O blood, um, the only other blood type that you are compatible with is type O, um, because you cannot produce those carbohydrates. Two of the human blood type alleles exhibit codominance. Um, these are A and B. So for example, you can have both of these carbohydrate types present in your blood cells. It's not as if one of those carbohydrate type alleles masks the other. They're actually both physically produced within the red blood cells. Again, both alleles are expressed in the phenotype. So if you have type AB blood, you have both carbohydrate type A and carbohydrate type B manufactured. Pleiotropy is when one gene influences several traits. Um, so for example, if you have an individual that's homozygous for the sickle cell allele, you are going to produce sickle cell hemoglobin, which is abnormally shaped. It's going to influence the functionality of your um, red blood cells. Basically, what this one single gene does is cause a cascade of effects. So this is an example of pleiotropy. This abnormal hemoglobin crystallizes into long flexible chains, which causes the red blood cells to become sickle shaped. So this is an example, sickle-shaped red blood cell. Normally red blood cells are somewhat round, um, and then these sickled cells can lead to a cascade of symptoms such as weakness, pain, organ damage, and paralysis. Another type of inheritance is polygenic inheritance. This is the additive effects of two or more genes on a single phenotype and many human traits are polygenic. Um, it used to be thought that eye color, for, for example, was controlled by a single gene, but it's actually controlled by several genes. That's why you can't necessarily predict what your eye color is um, very easily. So skin color is a great example of a polygenic pattern of inheritance. If you have um, a very dark person and a very light person producing um, offspring, for example, and then that um, child grows up and um, reproduces with a similarly um, colored individual, then there is an enormous variety of skin tones that their children could exhibit. So it's more of like a bell curve rather than um, either present or absent. Shifting gears a little bit here, um, the chromosomal basis of inheritance states that genes are located at specific positions or loci on chromosomes. I've already covered this in previous sections of this lecture. Um, but also the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and fertilization accounts for inheritance patterns.
So for example, linked genes are alleles that start out together on the same chromosome and they tend to travel together during meiosis and fertilization. So genes that are close together on a chromosome are called linked genes and these linked genes do not follow Mendel's law of independent assortment because they tend to be inherited as a set. Notice the terminology here though, they tend to be inherited as a set, that doesn't mean that they absolutely have to be inherited together. In biology, almost everything has um, an exception to the rule, and this is one of them. Drosophila melanogaster is a model organism, meaning that it has been used extensively for scientific research, and it's a great model for how these linked genes work. In the early 1900s, Thomas Hunt Morgan conducted studies on linked genes in New York City. And he used fruit flies, the common fruit fly, um, the specific name for that is Drosophila melanogaster, as a model organism. The wild type fly, so what you will typically see in the wild, they have gray bodies denoted by genotype big G, big G, and they have long wings denoted by genotype big L, big L. Thomas Hunt Morgan cultivated mutant fruit flies that had black bodies, so they had genotype little g, little g for that location, and short wings, genotype little l, little l, and crossed them with doubly heterozygous flies with the wild type phenotype. And I know this sounds like a mouthful, doubly heterozygous, that means simply that at both of those locations they're heterozygous, meaning they have one of each type of allele, but they still retain the wild type phenotype. So if they have one um, capital letter allele at each of those locations, that means that physically speaking they're still going to express those traits. So this individual is still going to have a gray body and long wings. So this is the cross that he experimented with. We had this doubly heterozygous wild type phenotype female here, um, along with this mutant with a black body and short wings. The results were the following. Um, the parental phenotypes dominated the, um, the offspring proportionally. So we had 83% of the resulting offspring having um, these parental phenotypes, but then we had recombinant phenotypes comprising 17% of the offspring. So again, as I was talking about earlier, some genes um, are independently assorted, meaning that they can recombine in subsequent generations. You're not necessarily only going to see gray-bodied being inherited with long wings, you might see gray bodies um, with short wings. And similarly, in this case, you're going to see some black-bodied flies with long wings. So how could black-bodied flies with long wings and gray-bodied flies with short wings be produced if the two genes involved are linked, meaning that they're always inherited together? From the results here, we can say that they're definitely not always inherited together. Most often than not, they are inherited together, but sometimes they are not. Well, the answer to this is crossing over between homologous chromosomes which produces new combinations of alleles. And I've already talked a little bit about crossing over um, when we covered mitosis and meiosis, but again this is just what that looks like. You have a pair of homologous chromosomes here, and during a crossing over event you're going to have a segment of one of these homologous chromosomes crossing and what you end up getting is this recombinant gamete. So you're going to have some parental gametes that have um, basically a mixed bag of alleles here.
and I've already talked a little bit about sex chromosomes. In humans, we either have two X chromosomes making us female, or we have an X and a Y making us male. Um, these sex chromosomes determine what sex we are. And there are some sex-linked disorders in humans. So a number of human conditions result from sex-linked genes. Um, there are many different disorders that are linked to the X chromosome and fewer disorders linked to the Y chromosome. Red-green colorblindness is an example of one of these, and it's characterized by a malfunction of light-sensitive cells in the eyes. If you are not colorblind, as in you have normal vision, you should be able to see that there is a number in this circle of dots here. So there's a number seven comprised of green dots. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, females are carriers, but men are typically actually affected by this disorder. Okay, I just have two more slides here. Um, this is a, an example that's not in your book, um, but, but an interesting one that I know of here um, regarding patterns of inheritance. So you may be familiar with some breeds of dogs that have what's known as a merle coat pattern. Um, in dachshunds, it's actually called dapple, but in most other breeds like Catahoula leopard dogs, collies, Australian shepherds, etc., um, this unique and visually striking color pattern is known as merle. So um, it can either be a red merle or a blue merle, but the genes are basically um, the same, the basics are the same, and the merle allele is dominant to the non-merle allele. So all normal merle dogs are heterozygous at this locus meaning they have one big M and one little m. So all of these dogs here with this interesting kind of splotchy color pattern have a big M and a little m at that particular locus on their chromosomes. Um, but we have an interesting thing occurring um, if you mate a merle dog to another merle dog. 25, there's going to be a 25% chance of, of, the, uh, of every offspring in the litter ending up with a double merle genotype. So they have to inherit two copies of that merle allele, and double merle dogs usually have a mostly white coat so typically, especially on the body, there's going to be almost no color pigmentation, but on the head there might be a little bit of color pigment, as you see in these two examples here. And unfortunately, eye and ear abnormalities are very common. Um, so some of, these, some of these offspring don't even make it to full-term pregnancy, and they're aborted, um, but for the puppies that do make it, um, eye and ear abnormalities are very common. So sometimes the eyes are malformed or greatly reduced in size. So you see that in this Australian Shepherd here and in this Great Dane. And oftentimes these dogs will also be deaf. So they might have blindness, they might have partial blindness, they might also have deafness or partial deafness. Um, so it's actually a very dangerous practice to breed a merle dog to another merle dog. Um, it's basically a genetic disaster. And um, unfortunately, some kennels will actually purposefully breed a double merle dog because when you have one parent having two capital M alleles, then that's going to mask any other allele at that locus, and 100% of the resulting puppies will be normal merle. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, and this concludes the chapter.